I was transported back to freshman year in high school. Now, that's terrifying enough. <laughs> but what I was aware of, what I was remembering, was this period in my life where I was filled with a mysterious insecurity. Now, that's not atypical. It's not unusual for freshman boys especially to experience times of insecurity, of uh, feeling like I don't know who I am, of change. And so I was at school one day, and I was talking with one of my teachers, who I kind of trusted, and I was sharing with him what had happened to me recently. I was finding that I was waking up in the middle of the night, and I had this sense that there was a presence in my room, and it wasn't a comfortable presence. And I didn't know what to do about it. It was leaving me feeling kind of insecure. And there was one night I woke up just shuddering because I was fear, filled with fear of dying. And I, I didn't know quite what to do with that. And it was leaving me really shaken. And my teacher listened to me for a little bit. And he finally looked at me and he said, Rodney, the next time it happens, sit up. Stare into the darkness and say as loudly and boldly as you can, in the name of Jesus Christ, leave. So believe it or not, the next week I woke up with this sense of dread of this presence in my room. And I sat up and I said, in the name of Jesus Christ, leave. And I immediately felt a sense of power. I was no longer alone. I was not fearful. I could feel the fear leave me as I felt a sense of power. And I said it again, in the name of Jesus Christ, leave. And it never happened to me again. I've used that a number of times in my life. And it was, it was sage wisdom from a teacher who just listened to me and spoke truth to me. And I didn't know at the time, but the truth he was speaking to me was from this part of Mark. Because this is exactly what Jesus is revealing to us as baptized members of his body. Is that there is a power available to us that we seldom call upon, but are encouraged to call upon it today. So let's take a little bit of, of a time to look at this passage and see the drama that's unfolding here before us. So at this point in the gospel, if you recall, Jesus has been baptized, he goes into the desert, he goes back to Nazareth, back in the Galilee, and he's waiting, and he hears that John has been arrested. And Jesus has to make this decision, who am I? What am I going to do? What am I going to be called to do? So he goes down to the lakeside in Capernaum, and we heard last week how he walked along the seashore, and he called together a group of men who he wanted to take into this revolution. He wanted to create his posse, if you will, to go and to preach the good news of revolution, that the kingdom of God is at hand. And he wanted to show people what that meant. But the problem is, Jesus is in Capernaum, which is a, a fishing village that had lots of visitors from throughout the Roman Empire. People came there to the market to buy and to trade. And there was this thriving fishing industry there. Although the members were oftentimes angry because of the oppression. And Jesus comes to them as the son of a tecton. The son of a carpenter. Somebody who works with their hands. Stonemasons and potters and farmers. They were looked upon by the wealthy and the elite as the lowest of the social order. They could barely feed their families. And oftentimes the religious leaders would point at them and say, look, look, you are not favored by God. You're barely alive. And they started to believe it. And Jesus was seen as one of them, one of those lowly tectons. And so he comes into Capernaum. 
And he's gathering together this group. And one of the things is he is low in the honor scale. And honor was the, the unit of exchange in that culture. Honor was what was prized. Honor was what was protected. And Jesus came to them without honor. Why? Because he had left his home. He had left his family. And he was trying to raise himself up in the culture by being a teacher. And those around him would have been very suspicious of him because in order for Jesus to raise his honor, somebody else's honor had to diminish. And so they were very resistant of what he was doing. So when he stands up in the synagogue in Capernaum that day, and he has the right to do that, as every righteous man in Israel had the right to do, he does something that is unique. When he teaches out of the Torah, he doesn't refer to other teachers like the rabbis did and like the scribes did. He doesn't refer to Hillel or Shemai or Shalel. He doesn't refer to the other teachers when he's making a point. He doesn't say, as it says in Exodus. No, what we're told is that Jesus taught by saying, I tell you, amen, amen, I say. And the people looked at him and they said, who does this guy think he is? Claiming to know the truth, claiming that the truth comes out of him. And so they're looking at each other and they're saying, where does this guy get this authority? Look, he's, he's a lowly, he's a carpenter. Where does he get this knowledge? And who does he think he is? And so while all this is going on around Jesus in the synagogue that day, he has the opportunity to show them from where his authority comes. And we hear it in the form of this impure spirit. Now, we have to understand, to, to take in this whole picture, there's a mind frame that the people of Jesus' day held about the spirit world, and it's important to keep in mind. So what the majority of people believed is that God is in heaven at the highest realm, the most powerful. And just below God, there's this hierarchy of powers. Just below God, there are these other gods and lords. We heard uh, Paul refer to it in 1 Corinthians. He talks about the gods of other people's belief. They're below God. They're not as powerful. And then below them are these spirits. And in the spirit world, there are both good spirits, benevolent spirits, and there are impure and malevolent spirits. And so below the spirit world is us. Humans in the created world. And what's the human life about? But trying to negotiate our way through each day, trying to stay with the good spirits and not letting the malevolent and the impure spirits get the best of us without stepping on God's toes. So we're trying to work our way up the power scale to get a little control over the spirit world without pretending that we're God. So this is what a lot of the people were doing in their spiritual lives. That's what they think Jesus is doing here. Jesus comes to them as a mere human, right? And so this situation, this drama unfolds when this impure spirit shows up in the man in the synagogue that day. Now remember, it's a Sabbath day, and the law says you can't heal on the Sabbath. And Jesus knows this, but Jesus is about honoring the Spirit of God. And so this spirit cries out to Jesus. And what does the spirit try to do? Get control over Jesus. Put Jesus down. Put Jesus in his place. And how does he do it? First he says, oh, Jesus, I know who you are. Have you come to destroy us? You don't have any real power. You're just the son of a carpenter. Oh, Maybe you're the Holy One of God. And there's this mocking that goes on. There's this degrading of Jesus, this dehumanizing of Jesus. And the people around him 
it, they kind of expect Jesus to kind of cower back. Certainly the impure spirit does, that this lowly human is going to cower and shrink back into his human state, certainly not confront the spirit. But the people around him expect Jesus to do something else. They expect him to do what all the other teachers would do, and that is to name the impure spirit. Because if you name something, you have control over it, and then you can tell it what to do. But Jesus doesn't do that either. He doesn't shrink back, and he doesn't play the normal game. He simply looks at the impure spirit. And from the same place he's been teaching, with the same authority of God, he looks at the spirit and he says, leave the man. Now it's shocking because Jesus is more concerned about the health and well-being of this man than he is about the law of the Sabbath, about the judgment of the people around him. The health and well-being of this man is his priority. And that is the source of his authority, is the love and compassion of God. And the, the impure spirit comes shrieking out of the man. And the people around him are left in wonder and awe as they say, Oh my God, this man has control over the spirit world. Jesus' power just elevated. But not only that, what's going through their minds is that Jesus spoke, impure spirit, leave the man, and it happened. That only happens with God. They know that that is Genesis, that's creation, that's Jesus speaking the same way God spoke into the chaos and formed light and earth, and the cosmos. God's word is immediately effective. And that's what Jesus does in this situation. Impure spirit, leave the man alone. I desire wholeness for him. I desire purity for him. I desire goodness for him. That's what reigns today. That's the authority of God's Holy Spirit. And the people are amazed. And Jesus' authority to go out and to continue to preach the revolution of the kingdom of God is elevated that day. The foundation is set. And his apostles are able to say, yes, this is the guy I want to attach myself to. This is a part, something I want to be a part of. Now, as powerful as that story is for Jesus, the good news is that you and I have the same promise as Jesus. You and I, as baptized members of his body, too, are the holy ones of God. You notice, God doesn't say to Jesus, you have the power, you are the Messiah, and you alone. No, Jesus shows us what it means to claim the power of God and to use it to cast out the impure spirits in our lives. Because see, the impure spirits only have power over us if we allow them to. We have the ability and the invitation to say, in the name of God, in the name of Jesus Christ, power of Holy Spirit, leave me away. We can do that today. And if you want to know the places to do that in your lives, where the impure spirits are showing up, ask the people who live with you. They'll point it out to you. Your gluttony and your selfishness, your places of pride and greed, they'll show you your prejudice. They'll show you your nagging and your despair, and it's not easy to receive that. But we can receive it because we have the power of God to overcome it by saying, impure spirit, leave me, and let the love and compassion and power of God flood into that space that is left void 
by that spirit fleeing. Let it be a shriek that comes out of you. Shake it off and let God's love fill you today.